Hello, my name is Chan Mei Yeok. I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist from KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. Next, I'd like to talk about medical futility, often called the F word. This is a very contentious concept. It implies that treatment does not help and nothing more can be done for the patient. Some people would divide futility into two types. One, where the likelihood of benefit is extremely low. For example, where there's no pathophysiological rationale. This type of futility really usually is a medical judgment. So for example, using um, a wrong antibiotic for a particular bacteria where you know it does not work. In this case, using that antibiotic is futile because you know it does not work. The next uh, category of futility uh, is where the quality of benefit is judged to be extremely poor, uh, in which case the overall burden or benefit ratio lies heavily on the burden side. This is not a medical judgment. This is really a value judgment. Uh, on uh, usually the patients will be the patients or the family will be the ones that know themselves best what their values are, and usually they are the ones that decide on on whether the quality of benefit is poor or not. But what is the problem with invoking medical futility? First of all, true futility is really rare. There's usually something that can be done, and it is, it is often very very unlikely that nothing can be done. And sometimes these so-called medical judgments are really value judgments and they are not best made by the medical team. Often medical futility is decided by the medical team unilaterally and often that is, is very controversial because, like I said, value judgments are often better made by the family and the patient rather than by the medical team. And finally, patients and family often see the invoking futility as giving up. So the definition of futility is really a futile exercise. This um, graph on the left uh, shows a study done um, with medical staff asking them what they consider as futile in terms of the probability of the treatment succeeding. And as you can see from the, the graph, it ranges from as low as zero to as high as 60%, which means that some physicians feel that even though there is a 60% chance of the treatment being a success, they can still call it futile. On the right, this is a table uh, of results in a study done on patients um, and their family members where they are asked to define what they consider as futility. Um, and as you can see, again, the, the choices range from 0% all the way to 30%. And there are people who even consider uh, uh, percentages higher than 30% as futile, as, as can be seen. So really, medical futility is inherently linked to hope on the part of patients and to rational use of limited resources on the part of medical team. This is also known as distributive justice. Rather than invoking futility, it may be better to um, redirect hope to a more realistic goal. So instead of saying, you know, this is futile, don't do this, uh, in this way you are taking away hope, perhaps it might be easier uh, or uh, more appropriate and more palatable to the patient to say that, you know, instead of hoping for a cure, why not hope for symptom control, hope for uh, a painless death, uh, for example. Predictive scoring systems like the Apache score that is used in intensive care can help medical team with categorizing groups to say whether a particular treatment is going to be successful or not. But it is not useful as a decision tool for a particular individual. It's more useful in categorizing groups. If 
Finally, are physicians or even society ethically obligated to provide whatever treatment the patient desires? Some may say that uh, they are not. And what happens uh, when, medical when there is disagreement about medical fertility is that you can have distressing and polarizing situations like the cases of Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans, amongst many others, where there is disagreement with what, is, what constitutes fertility and what constitutes inappropriate uh, therapies. Inappropriate therapy is defined as one that is not suitable or useful for a particular situation. It's not necessarily only medical suitability, however. So, for example, is a therapy inappropriate because its utility is unknown or because it has no scientific rationale? Or is it inappropriate because the cost-benefit ratio tips it heavily on the cost side, where the cost to the patient in terms of adverse events is too heavy? Uh, or the cost to society in terms of resource allocation is too heavy. So some people might say, if you have an inappropriate therapy that is unknown, it is unknown whether it is going to be useful or not, how about giving a trial? Then when uh, it doesn't work, then we can withdraw the, the therapy. So this brings me to the topic of withdrawing versus withholding there are inappropriate therapies. Technically, there is no legal or ethical difference between withdrawing and withholding inappropriate therapies. However, there may be an emotional or psychological difference on the part of the family and patient, and maybe even the medical team. The medical team often finds it very difficult morally and emotionally to withdraw therapies that have been started rather than to withhold it. And, but if indeed a limited trial of a potentially inappropriate therapy is being negotiated with the patient and the family, it would be prudent to ensure that the goals and endpoints are clear and agreed upon by all stakeholders so that when the time comes to withdraw therapy, there's not going to be conflict again. It is also important to understand and to articulate the underlying reason for withdrawing and withholding a therapy, which is usually that it is not beneficial or that it causes more harm than benefit to the patient and therefore is an inappropriate. It is also important to remember that the death that results is due to the underlying medical, medical condition and not due to the act of withdrawing or withholding. Therefore, in general, withdrawing and withholding an inappropriate therapy is not considered euthanasia. However, there are differing views um, that withholding a therapy, withdrawing or withholding a therapy is considered um, a euthanasia. And there is a distinction between withdrawing and withholding in the sense that uh, withholding a therapy is considered passive euthanasia where death is caused by an omission of an act, as opposed to active euthanasia where death is caused by a deliberate or direct act, which is what uh, withdrawing a therapy achieves. Yet others find the concept of passive and active euthanasia unnecessarily confusing and hold the view that euthanasia is defined by the intention behind the act, or rather the non-act. So I will be discussing euthanasia later. Suffice it to say, that the intention behind withdrawing or withholding inappropriate therapy is to not prolong the dying process and to allow death to occur. By inappropriate therapy, most people will understand it to be medical therapies like giving antibiotics, intubation and ventilation, surgery, etc. But what about a patient who needs nutrition and hydration through a nasogastric tube? Usually these are patients who are in a permanent uh, vegetative state or PVS or sometimes in a state of severe dementia so that they are unable to feed themselves and therefore need artificial uh, nutrition and hydration given usually through uh, tube either in the nasogastric or in the gastrostomy. 
So is providing nutrition and hydration artificially through a tube considered a form of medical therapy? If it is considered a form of medical therapy, then we can uh, treat it the same way as we treat withdrawing or withholding uh, an inappropriate therapy. Although some view it as burdensome, uh, burdensome therapy that is prolonging the dying process, others consider uh, nutrition and hydration as the most basic and essential form of comfort care and therefore it's not ethical to withdraw it. But most would agree that feeding through a tube is not natural and thus can be considered a form of medical therapy with specific goals and endpoints that require informed consent by a competent patient. In fact, this is often recognised that uh, this is considered nutrition therapy and in departments that specialise it, in it, now they, nowadays they are called departments of gastroenterology, hepatology and nutrition to give the provision of nutrition therapy its importance and its due. So if we consider that artificial nutrition and hydration is just another form of medical therapy, then decision-making could follow, as was previously described. However, cases in the past, which include cases like Terry uh, Schiavo, Nancy Cruzan, and Anthony Bland, which went to court, shows that this is a very contentious uh, um, uh, issue, um, which can lead to very protect protracted legal battles that does not serve society well. At the heart of the dispute is really deferring personal values about what constitutes a life that is worth living. And it may be difficult uh, to just limit this to a medical decision.